Hey. You there. Come here, I want to tell you a secret. Come closer, it's okay. This is not Sparta. And this is my Athenaeum. Today we're counting down the top five terrible modern myths about ancient Sparta. What? Somebody told me listicles were back in style. Oh, you want to know why I think it's important that we talk about Sparta right now? Well, I'm afraid it's the same answer I usually have. Fascists. Oh man, not fascists again. I thought fasces were a Roman thing. Well, yeah, they were. But since one of neo-Nazis and white supremacists ever cared about accuracy in their historical takes, you know, they just love the ancient world until you try to tell them any facts that we actually know about it. Heck, they still seem to think that all those white marble statues were unpainted. Ha! So what have these right-wing extremists got to do with Sparta? Well, somehow, the Spartans have become a symbol for racial purity and military might. I'd blame the movie 300, but really it started a long time before that, and that's just one source. Albeit an extremely weird and popular one. I mean, the Spartans are all white, cis, straight beefcake guys, and the Persians are people of color who are coded gay, except that they're literally inhuman. I... Mm. In any case, uh, Sparta, the Battle of Thermopylae, anything associated with them have become embedded as symbols in the far-right cause. It's not uncommon to see swastikas hanging next to Greek lambdas, which stand for the Spartan homeland, Laconia. And you have these gun nuts going around with this phrase, Molon la baie, tattooed on their arms. Uh, Molon la baie is Greek for come and get it. As if they're weird, dangerous hobby was in any way comparable to imminent battle. So we should talk about what ancient Sparta was really like, and see how it is that these fascists are uh, taking their lambdas. Myth number five, Spartan government was a model for stability. <laughs> uh, sorry, I really shouldn't laugh at that. Uh, people have this impression that Spartan government was extra stable and, you know, really stood the test of time. And, and it is true that Spartan government stood unchanged for hundreds of years. And that gives people the impression that it was somehow better than democracy, tyranny, all of the other variations that cropped up in other cities and came and went with the times. If it lasted for centuries, they must have been doing something right, right? Not in the slightest. I, all it means is that the people at the top had an iron grip on their power and decided to cling to it even when it was very clear that they were unavoidably headed for destruction. In order to talk about Spartan governance, we need to talk about their mythical founding father, Lycurgus. It's said that Lycurgus set down a grand constitution of very idealistic and forthright laws delineating the way that government would work. He put forth two hereditary lines of kings who would keep each other in check. And then a council of elders called the Gerousia, which would have the power to rebuke the kings if necessary. 
and then a grand council of all of the voting people of Sparta called the Apella, and they would have the power to make new laws. And all of this would be governed by the ideals of equality, shared wealth, and never having to work again. Of course, this was mostly nonsense. Every writer who wrote on Spartan governance from Plutarch in the 1st century CE all the way back to Herodotus in the 5th century BCE said, oh, well, of course it's not that way now. It's been corrupted in the modern age, but uh, it was true just a few generations ago. In reality, this time, like Lycurgus himself, probably never existed. Uh, to be fair, the bones of the system did exist. You did have two hereditary lines of kings, a council of elders called the Gerousia, and the general assembly called the Apella, in which, theoretically, every citizen could vote. But the Apella basically had no power, since their agenda was set for them by the Gerousia, and the Gerousia was made up of men handpicked by the kings. And perhaps most importantly, wealth was not distributed equally. The kings obviously had the most, and the families they favored accrued wealth and power. If any Spartan citizen family got too poor, well, they were just ejected. Oh, you can still live here, you just don't get your rights anymore, you silly poors. Actually, the Spartan class system was rigidly stratified. And the people we've been discussing on the top are just a small portion of what you'd find. Those people were the citizens. They're called Spartiates, or Spartiates. But alongside the Spartiates, you'd find those free, no longer citizens who'd been kicked out for being too poor, or too cowardly, or whatever. Also, any resident foreigners, where by foreigner I mean their family moved to the city after the classes were stratified, so they could have been there for many generations. And then there were also a lot of people living around the city and not really quite in it that are called the perioikoi, or those who live around. Um, and all of those classes are not citizens, they don't have voting rights or anything, but they're free. And then there are the helots. What's a helot? Well, the short answer is a slave. But then why bother to call them something different than a slave like you might find in Athens or Corinth or Egypt or Persia, the normal sort of chattel slavery found all over the ancient Mediterranean? Well, hold on to your kiton, because this one is going to be rough. Around 730 BCE, Sparta conquered its neighboring city-state of Messenia. Instead of doing any of the usual things that ancient civilizations did to conquer neighboring towns, they decided to make all of the Messenians into a perpetual slave class. So that whole idealistic thing we got from Lycurgus of, uh, no one will ever have to work again, well, for the Sparshits, that was actually true because the Helots did literally all of the work. Spartan citizens considered it demeaning to so much as tend a garden or weave a piece of cloth. And I'm not exaggerating that. We have records of Spartans expressing contempt for the Persian king for having a hobby garden. And the Spartan citizens made up at most 10% of the population of Sparta with the free non-citizens making up another 12-ish percent at that time, that means the slaves, the helots, outnumbered the citizens by at least four to one, when there were the most citizens. 
Even for a slave society, that is not a normal proportion. For comparison's sake, Athens at a similar time had a ratio of about one slave per citizen. And a few hundred years later, in the peak of Rome's glory, citizens outnumbered slaves about six to one. And Rome lived in constant fear of slave revolt. And the Helots did revolt a number of times, but they had been so thoroughly terrorized and subjugated that they were overworked, exhausted, and malnourished. It took a literal act of nature, a giant earthquake that reshaped the land and killed hundreds regardless of class to free any significant portion of the Mycenaeans. The other thing to understand about this really deeply unsettling class system is that there was no mechanism for becoming a Spartiate. Not even if your family had been Spartiates two generations ago. Not even if you became a hero. There was just no way. We have no records of anyone ever making that transition. So with people getting kicked out of citizenship and no way to replace them, well, even without warfare and constant Mycenaean revolt, eventually the ruling class was going to become small enough that it would cease to function. So sure, I guess stylistically, Sparta had the same government for centuries on end, but in reality, the wealthy landowners kept cutting off their nose to spite their face. They just didn't want to own up to the bad judgment calls that got them in trouble. Myth number four, Sparta was a model for racial purity. So that's horrifying with all of the slavery and meh, but doesn't that lend credence to the bigots' proposition that the Spartiates, at least, were racially pure. I mean, they kept kicking out all the people they found undesirable, right? Let me stop you there. No. No, 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 no. Projecting modern conceptions of race backward onto the ancient Greeks and other ancient peoples is beyond anachronistic. It makes no sense, and they wouldn't have known what the heck you were talking about. No. First of all, as I've made clear in other videos before, race in the way we conceive of it now just was not a thing. I mean, yeah, they were aware of people's skin color and facial features and sometimes even how that corresponded to geographic locations in a sort of general sense, but that wasn't really the way that they categorized people. It was very different. And they certainly wouldn't have considered themselves white. Even if that had existed as a category, it probably would have referred more to those barbarians up north. Heck, even by modern standards. <laughs> Within living memory, people in the US didn't think Greek people were white. So no, Greece, Sparta, was not a haven for pure, tan, buff, white men. That just doesn't even make sense. But we also have plenty of evidence that most Greek city-state populations were what we today might consider mixed phenotype. They would have had a range of skin and hair colors from light and blonde to dark and black. Those statues were painted, my friends, and uh, not always pasty pastel peach. And that is before we come back to the part where I remind you that the Spartiates, the only portion of the population who could even plausibly fit into this silly argument, made up less than 10% of the population of Sparta. Psst. Now, this is ridiculous. Myth number three, the Spartans genocide disabled babies. That's a f Feels weird to say that sentence fun, but... <laughs> oh, 
okay, but I've heard this story about Spartans throwing disabled babies off of mountainsides. Like, I don't want to put up a straw fascist here, but isn't that kind of eugenics? It's not just a straw fascist argument. Here's a passage from the Occidental Observer, a white supremacist website. In Sparta and Rome, the killing of deformed children was mandatory, an exercise in negative eugenics. Well, it's certainly true that all across the culture, Greek city-states practiced infanticide by exposure. There's no particular evidence to suggest that Sparta partook of this horror any more or less than anywhere else. There is some wild tale in Plutarch of a grand and gruesome execution ritual, but you have to keep in mind, he was writing in the first century CE, hundreds of years after Sparta's power was broken. Oh, I did mention that Sparta kind of ceased to be a major player on the world stage in, like, the 4th century BCE. No? Well, I'll get into it in more detail later, but surely you can reason out from our previous discussion of Spartan governance that it was kind of inevitable. Anyway, the point here is that Plutarch wasn't exactly speaking from first-hand experience when it came to Spartan rituals from the classical era. There's no evidence from the time of Spartans tossing babies, disabled or otherwise, over cliffs or into wells. Archaeologists have found a well in Sparta that does contain human remains, but they're all adults, and as far as we can tell, they were people who were executed for crimes against the state. If you want a well full of baby bones, you need to go to Athens. So, were there disabled people in Sparta? Of course there were. Disabled people, just like neurodiverse people, or gay people, or trans people, whatever, have always existed. And I'm not just talking about helots, who were probably mostly disabled by lives filled with backbreaking labor, systemic abuse, existential fear, and malnutrition. And I'm not just talking about the free non-citizens, for whom I have little evidence. But we know of, for instance, a Spartan king, Agesilaos, who was born with a club foot. Not exactly the kind of person you expect to become king in a society if they're doing eugenics against disabled people. Myth number two. Spartan women had it good. Ooh, here is an interesting one, because you hear it not only from the Nazis, but also from feminists who just really want to find some place in the ancient world where they can say, see, women had rights. Like, to start with this one, I, I don't really need to explain Hila women, do I? Like, there was a whole subclass of free non-citizens who were bastards born from Helot women and Sparshit men, and you know how that comes about. Rape. It's, it's rape. When a free person has sex with a slave, it is always rape. Yeah? Now, I'm not gonna deny that Sparshit women had a pretty decent run as far as women in ancient Greece. I mean, compared to Athenian noble women, for instance, they had it really good. You know, they were taught to read and write right alongside the men. They had freedom to be in public. They were uh, allowed to play sports and even have their own physical contests. And they never had to work because that was demeaning for a Spartan citizen. So they spent their time in scholarship and sport and other idle practices. But they still weren't considered independent people. They couldn't vote. They were married off by arrangement of the men. They were basically considered brood mares and often shared around if, you know, somebody's wife was found to be barren. They were citizens, but they were second-class citizens. And now you might be thinking, Okay, I get why the feminists want to think this, but why would 
white supremacists who are notoriously anti-woman try to spread this particular myth. Well, let me give you a bit of a taste of how they frame it in a passage from A Voice for Men, a men's rights activist website. Gynocentric society treats men as instruments to provide for and protect women and children. The radical proposition that men's lives are no less valuable than women's lives remains nearly inconceivable today amid absurdly false elite orthodoxy about violence against women. Genocentric ideology, rather than social necessity, drives violence against men. Ancient Greek epigrams highlight mothers' key roles in enforcing gynocentric ideology. Demetrius, when your mother received you after your flight from the battle, having lost all your fine ornaments, she herself immediately drove the death-dealing spear through your sturdy side and said, Die, and let Sparta bear no blame. It was no fault of hers that my milk reared cowards. The mother killing her own son for fleeing from battle indicates a grotesque, gynocentric ideal of courage. The idea that women and minorities have not less power, but too much power in society is a necessary driving force of the classic fascist paradox of weakness and strength. The fascists must be strong enough that they can take on all comers, but also weak enough that any protest against the status quo is an existential threat. Not that this idea of the Spartans being so battle-mad that even the women were hard asses is a wholly modern invention, no. As you can see from the ancient source that that MRA quoted. The Spartans loved this image for themselves. With your shield or on it, am I right? But this framing of it as gynocentric, with women holding all the power? I'm sorry, bro, that's a modern one. And it makes sense if you think about it fitting in right alongside that conception of Sparta being full of the idealized manly man masculine warrior. Which brings us to... Myth number one. Sparta was great at war. What? This is the number one thing everybody knows. The Spartans were great at war. How, how can this be a myth? Let's investigate, shall we? So let's begin with an analysis of Sparta's battle success. They single-handedly held off the Persians and they beat the Athenians in war. And that means that they were super always the best at fighting ever. Or does it? Let's take it back as far as we know. We start with two hereditary lines of kings, one claiming descent from the mighty Heracles, the other from the house of Menelaus and Agamemnon. Mighty warrior kings they claimed for themselves, and they fought and defeated their neighbor Messenia in the 8th century BCE. How'd they do at it? The first time they attacked, Messenia kicked their butts. Even Herodotus, who loves the Spartans and goes way out of his way to talk about how cool they were and gives them their best Thermopylian quotes that still get quoted today, has to admit that they had to go through some pretty wacky shenanigans involving digging up dead heroes' bones in order to get the advantage. They did eventually conquer them, though, so one for two the worst slave system I've ever heard of. Me? So, not so great there. But surely in the Persian Wars, I mean, that's Thermopylae, right? They single-handedly turned back the Persians, right? Mm. So, in the Persian War, Sparta was part of a big coalition of Greek city-states, all fighting against the Persians. And yeah, it is very impressive in the grand scheme of things that a bunch of 
backwater nobodies from beyond the furthest reaches of the great Achaemenid Empire managed to turn back the king's armies? But it wasn't really Sparta that did it. I mean, I feel a little bit bad having to bring this up, but the 300 lost at Thermopylae. They all died. And it wasn't really that that turned the Persians back. It was the naval battle at Salamis where the Athenian fleet fought off the Persian fleet that convinced the Persians it was just too costly to keep fighting these yobos. The sacrifice of the 300 was a propaganda event, but not really momentous in the war. Oh, and, um... By the way, the Spartan 300 weren't actually alone at Thermopylae, even after most of the Greeks decided to regroup elsewhere. About 700 other Greek warriors stayed behind to fight the lost cause with them. So, yeah, I'm afraid that one's just Spartan propaganda. It's a big nope on Thermopylae. Ah, but the Peloponnesian War... They beat Athens. This was a grand feat for the Spartans. Well, to summarize all of Thucydides, eh, not really. Just to start with, Sparta practically had to be dragged into war with Athens. Athens was chomping at the bit, raring to go. Their general Pericles had this whole plan for a grand Athenian empire, well, grander than it already was, and he was counting on the Spartiates being kind of lazy about it and slow to act and unwilling to put forth a lot of forces lest the Helots revolt. And he was right. Sparta's neighboring Peloponnesian city-states had to really poke and prod and force them into doing anything at all. And when they finally did... Okay, so they raided Athens' crops a couple of times, six years apart. The Athenians just waited inside their walls until stuff back at Sparta got too unsteady and came back out. In the end, there were really three things that turned the tide of this battle from Athens to Sparta, and none of them were Spartan prowess. First, you had Athenian overreach. They tried to go and take Sicily, which was A, much further away than they thought it was, and B, much bigger, more populated, and better defended than they had any idea. Second, there was a lot of internal strife in all of the city-states because the war between... Athens and Sparta had become sort of this ideological battle wherein the Athenian side represented democracy and the Spartan side represented oligarchy and just basically everyone's mess. Third, and most vitally, the Spartans got naval help. They had no navy of their own, so they sent, and I am not kidding, they sent for aid from Persia. It might even be fair to say that the Spartan reputation for badassery, which really seems to have been spun of whole cloth out of their grand sacrifice at Thermopylae via various propaganda outlets, broke only a few months into the war with Athens. There was a tiny island called Sphacteria, and a couple of Spartan hoplites got trapped on it, and the Athenians just stayed on their boat and shot at them until they surrendered. Spartans surrendering was just not conceivable, and yet it happened early in the war. And once the Spartans did, using Persian aid, finally cut Athens off from its source of wealth, they eventually beat Athens 
raised its city walls and installed their own government, which, to the dismay of all of those idealists all around the other Greek city-states, was not oligarchy, but tyranny. The imposed government fell apart very, very quickly. Athens recovered within a generation, but Sparta never really did. In the 4th century, a new war called the Theban War began, and Sparta faced off against the Theban Sacred Band, a troop made entirely of pairs of male lovers, the idea being that you fight harder to protect your lover than to protect yourself. That battle at Leuctra was the end of Sparta as a military power. By the time Alexander the Great got to wiping them off the map, there were fewer than 4,000 Spartans left. According to an analysis by Dr. Brett Devereaux, a military historian at UNC Chapel Hill, the Spartan batting average, which is to say their success rate at the battles we know about, is about 0.486, or worse than even odds. It gets even worse if you only count the battles where Sparta was fighting without other Greek city-states in coalition. As for individual battle strength, that's not really how they fought. They were phalanx fighters, a formation of fighters. They didn't really fight alone ever. The gear that they were famous for was the round aspis shield, which was made of heavy bronze and would have to rest not only on your arm, but on your shoulder to stay up. And that means you can't really move it to cover your right side where your spear is. So even if the Spartan phalanx was a smidge more flexible than other Greek phalanxes, they had more officers, it really didn't lend itself to individual combat. So much for Assassin's Creed Odyssey, am I right? Side note, but they definitely did not all have identical Greek lambdas. They would paint their shields individually with their own insignia, and they could tell which, which one was which. Group fighting, individual gear. Besides, Spartans never did any weapons training outside of battle. Whoa, whoa, okay. Before you go typing about a hog again in the comments, just hear me out. All the fashy bros love agoge. So what the heck is agoge? Well, the Spartan take on child soldier indoctrination. I mean, uh, male coming of age rituals. At the age of seven, all Sparshit boys, and any boys from the free non-citizen classes who had a Sparshit sponsor, would be isolated from their families and put into little roving gangs. These boys would be consistently maltreated by their Sparshit elders. They were often starved, certainly underfed, and they basically had to steal food in order to make up the difference. But if they were caught stealing, they would be severely punished. In fact, they were often severely beaten for various reasons or no reason at all, sometimes until they died. At age 12, the surviving children would be paired with an older Spartan man between the ages of 20 and 30. This man would be their mentor. And it's unclear from our sources whether the sexual abuse in that situation was codified as part of the ritual education, or whether it was just inevitable given the conditions that this created. And <laughs> they called the Athenians boy lovers, huh? <laughs> uh, wait, 300 seriously said that? The Athenians, those philosophers and uh, boy lovers. Okay, I guess we need to make a small detour here to talk about Greek sexuality. Um, they really did not conceive of gay and straight and bi the way that we do in the modern world. Um, it was the duty of 
all healthy young men and women to marry someone of the opposite sex so that they could produce children. But, to paraphrase Archilochus, that wasn't the only form of Aphrodite, if you catch my drift. Aside from Sappho, very few writers paid any attention to women loving other women. But we have lots of evidence for men who loved other men. And yes, we do have evidence for intersex and non-binary folks and them having sex, but it's always going to be a small percentage. The only real problems for the Greeks arose either when a woman slept with a man who wasn't her husband, because that could beget a child out of wedlock, or if somebody of either sex, any sex, shunned marriage bed altogether. This is probably what was behind the comedic playwright Aristophanes calling his fellow playwright Euripides a woman hater. So no, the ancient Greeks didn't have anything against gay people. They wouldn't really have understood that terminology. And it also doesn't mean that all male-male pairings were pedophilic like this garbage system that Sparta had. Some or all of the boys who survived to age 20 would graduate by killing a helot. The ritual, called Cryptea, consisted of hiding in helot territory, watching until somebody made some kind of mistake, and then jumping out to murder them. This had the twin effects of further traumatizing a boy who had just undergone 13-ish years of beatings, rape, and neglect, and of keeping the helots in a perpetual state of existential terror since they could be killed at literally any time. Of course, the graduates didn't all become Spartiates, because those of free non-citizen birth could not. But even beyond that, those who were eligible still ran the risk of getting kicked out of the Sparsha class, along with their entire family, if they didn't get accepted into a social eating club. These little cliques were formed in the basically like mess hall groups or military units, and they would generally consist of people of similar rank and wealth, all sharing an equal portion of a daily table. They would eat together, they would play together, and if you didn't get accepted into one, you get the boot. Oh, and they weren't allowed to marry a woman until they were 30, just in case you were wondering about that age range being paired with a younger boy. This is not military training or any kind of education. This is indoctrination and abuse. It's beat for beat the method that cults and unscrupulous armies used to train child soldiers. The isolation, the breaking down of self, the relentless abuse, the formation of a group identity, and the necessity of justifying what happened to you by perpetuating it on the next generation. The agoge may have started out as a stricter form of child rearing, but it ended as something heinous, and it perpetuated for hundreds of years. So much for uh, child training. What about adult sparshits? Well, they also had no weapon training. According to Dr. Devereaux, with that kind of phalanx formation, you really don't need it. You just have to be fit enough to hold up your shield and spear and do what your commander tells you. So, to sum up this particular myth, Spartan battle prowess holds up to scrutiny neither on the state level nor the individual level. It's all PR and idealization. And as for agoge, if you somehow still think that agoge is a good idea, please seek outside help. 
All right then. So that's it for our top five myths about ancient Sparta. I want to give a serious thanks to Classics Twitter for providing me more scholarly material on this subject than I could possibly get through. Um, especially want to shout out Brett Devereaux, Sarah Bond, Mike Cole, and Spencer McDaniels for their particular works, which I found very useful and enlightening. They're linked below. And also Pharaoh's Classics, who dedicate their time to cataloging fascist misuses of the ancient Mediterranean. Amazing work. I am really grateful for it. So remember, this is not and should never be Sparta. Keep learning, friends. Thank mm-hmm. you.